My scrapbook. Quite a Bible to me, this book. It's fallen to bits, a wee bit like myself. Full of cuttings of all the early spring and autumn meetings of the Royal and Ancient Golf Club. The players, the courses, the great matches, the grand tournaments. Memories just flood back. <laughs> I haven't introduced myself. In case you don't know, my, my name is Tom Morris. Born and bred St. Andrea. We were all born with webbed feet and a golf club in our hand here. I've played golf close on 80 years, and that's more than most folk get to live. <laughs> my schooling was sparse, where well, I was never off the course. And then I went to work with Alan Robertson. That's him up there. He was known as the, the world's first golf professional, I suppose, in a way he was. We made feathery golf balls together. It was before the advent of the gutta percha ball. In 1851, I moved to Prestwick. I was invited to be keeper of the greens there, arranged by James Ogilvy Fairley. Here he is, my main man. I was so impressed with this man that I named my second son after him, James Ogilvy Fairley Morris. Thirteen years I was there, and I was invited back to be custodian of the links by the Royal and Ancient in St Andrews, and I held that position for 40 years. I'm a four times winner of the Open Championship, 
1861, 62, 64, 67. As was my son Tommy. 68, 69, 70 and 72. Because of his three wins in a row, he got the championship belt to, to keep. <laughs> Youngest and oldest winners of the Open Championship. Me at 46 and Tommy, believe it or not, 17 years old. 1869, we were, we were winner and runner-up. Father and son, eh? imagine that. I'd opened a shop, of course it uh, ran right up to my retirement just recently in 1904. I'm just sitting above it at the moment. And you can see by that photograph there, uh, hanging out the window, looking at the men there, all lined up. <laughs> so there you are. What about this scrapbook? Ah, the great match. All my main men are in this one, apart from myself. I always like to think of the early days, the old grey skyline of the town, the gentlemen, the matches. That's Sir Hugh Lyon Playfair putting out, watched intently by Mr Blackwood. No, oh, Alan Robertson carrying the clubs with his red sweat bonnet on. The Earl of Leaven there, the Earl of Eglinton behind him, Colonel Fairley behind him. <laughs> oh, there's my man, J.O. Fairley, with a yellow felt hat on. <laughs> Sandy Perry and his son Caddy, and what excitement, eh? <laughs> I took over from him as Keeper of the Greens, you know. <laughs> and Sir Ralph Anstruther willing that pot out. <laughs> uh, oh, there's Mr. Cheeps. Sitting there on the right, of course, he owned the ground at that time, you know. Eh? Oh, and a wee ginger beer cellar, eh? Oh, happy days, right enough. The man who's in that print that's hauling the putts, Sir Hugh Lyon Playfair, I suppose you could say that he was the, the saviour of St Andrews in many ways. He was a provost in 1849, but oh, this town was in a, a real state. So he, uh, he cleaned it up. So Sir Hugh comes along... And he decides that we'll have rules and regulations, 40 rules that have to be obeyed. <laughs> eh? No person shall ride or drive in a furious or improper manner along any of the streets and lanes. No vagrancy or begging will be permitted within the bounds of police. <laughs> no cart shall be loaded with dung as to allow droppings on the street. <laughs> <coughs> Aye, oh, it seemed to do the trick right enough. Of course, golf was fast expanding at this time, and Sir Hugh organised our first railway line. Mm -hmm. Went to pay for it herself. Edinburgh, Perth and Dundee line wouldn't pay for it. No, 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 no. Anyway, you can see the station over there by the second fairway. Oh, we had to move it into the town because folk were getting off the train and onto the course. Same year, laying of the foundation stone for the RNA. You can be sure Sir Hugh was involved in that too. <laughs> the town had a real buzz about it again. What a difference that building made to the look of the place. As you can see, he was some man with Sir Hugh, eh? <laughs> now, oh, dear me. The home hole. I can hardly make that out at all. Well, of course, an early photograph about 1850, you see. <laughs> ah, you can just make out the last green. Alan's house on the corner, where we made the feathery balls. And and the old union parlour behind it. Ah, that's better. Aye. Oh, Alan and I are in this one, just to the left there. And of course, there's, there's Sir Hugh again, <laughs> leaning against the entrance. And this was used as the clubhouse before the Royal and Ancient was built. Let's see that old photograph again. Aye, aye. Aye, here we are. Now you see, there's the lifeboat shed and the communal drying green. <laughs> Uh, the road that runs across the fairway was a track for pulling the lifeboats out. Oh, aye, aye. Just at the edge there, is Hugh Philp's workshop. Aye, Hugh Philp came how to make a club just as Alan and I knew how to swing one. I've got one of his clubs here. Oh, Hugh's. A baffy. You know why it was called a baffy? It's the sound it made. Listen. Hmm. Aye, we're a 
said we were making feathery balls of them. Poof. Hard work, I'll tell you. I fell out with Alan. Well, it was just the, the advent of the gutta Persia ball, of course. Alan had been a, a ball maker, and his father David Robertson before him, and his father before him, so... Obviously, there was a lot of tension in the shop as to whether or not there'd be, there'd be any more trade for the feathery. I'd run out of feathery's one day when I was playing with one of the members, and uh, he lent me one of the new, the new balls, and of course, guess what happened? Alan caught me out in the course with it. Oof, wasn't he pleased? We had words back at the shop and went our separate ways, but uh, I can still feel the heat and smell the leather. <laughs> you know, you physically had to use a chest clamp and you had to pull that ball right in to pack the feathers in, you see? That's what happened was that you you boiled goose down, we usually used, into a lump hat, and it was handy for a measure. You stitched the ball, as you can see, inside out, and then the feathers were packed and compressed into it. And, uh, well, life got a lot easier after that with this, uh, this man here. Of course, changed golf completely. Up to that point, two and six was a ball, a lot of money. Needed six balls, maybe, to give to your caddy, so, of course, the... The ordinary folk couldn't afford to play, but once this, this rubber came along, my goodness, strips of rubber were used. You just heated it up. You usually had a bucket of hot water there and heated up the strips, kneaded them together into a rough ball shape, and then you just simply rolled it out by hand on a table, you see. <laughs> now we got out of shape after your game, providing you still had it. <laughs> it went back into the bucket of water and back into shape, of course. These first days, uh, to get consistency in the ball, we used to scar them, obviously. You painted them white or you never have found them. I mean, the textures of the course, it was hard enough finding balls, but as you can see, we just, we just took a knife and scarred in through them like this. <laughs> there, you can see there was a lot more scarring to be done on the ball. And then, of course, the, the gutty mould was invented. Well, that was a great breakthrough, that, because then you see the consistency of pattern then. Oof. Some grand photographs here. The original big three. Tom Morris, Willie Park, Alan Robertson. <laughs> ah, he made some matches. This one's a Willie Dunn and Willie Park against Alan and I. You know, we were never beaten in foursomes, you know, never been. Of course, foursomes were the most popular way of playing at that time. Oh, I attracted a lot of attention. Uh, here we are again. Same place, same day. Posed photographs. Well, you had to stand like that for quite a while because of the exposure. <laughs> you can see Alan's moved his head a wee bit. Well, he looks half asleep standing behind him there. <laughs> you hear that? That's the sound of a feathery ball being hit by a play club. Grand Tournament, 1857. Oh, what a group photograph that is, eh? All the players involved in this match, eh? First official tournament, really. All the clubs were invited to send two men to represent them. Oh, they came from Brunsfield, Prestwick, Perth, the Royal and Ancient, Blackheath. Mr George Glenny, that's him there, but he won it with Mr Campbell. Both Scotsmen, though, so that wasn't so bad. There's Mr. Fairley, and as you can see, I'm carrying his clubs. Oh, I often carried for him in matches. Well, we all did. And there we have Glenny teeing up. I'm fairly hitting. Here I'm carrying again. What's this one here? George Glenny's portrait. Oh, he did a lot for golf, this man. Of course, he was secretary of Blackheath at the time when they won that tournament. He also became a captain at Prestwick and a captain of the RNA in 1884. So, he must have spent his whole life in the administration of the game. He even played for a medal, and still play for it today. The George Glennie Medal, part of the autumn meeting. Alan Robertson's obituary, I'm afraid. September the 8th, 1859. Alan Robertson.
the greatest golfer that ever lived, who alone in the annals of time, it can be said, was never beaten. That was debatable, but... Uh, well, he never had a day's illness in his life. And in the spring of 59, he took an attack of jaundice and he just seemed to wither away and die. 42 he was. Great loss. He was a pocky sort of character, Alan. You can see by these photographs I've just shown you. But, uh, he had a good sense of fun about him. Oh, wonderful swing. You know, I never saw Alan force a ball. Here's his play club here. <coughs> yeah, for the, the size of Alan, this was some length on this shaft. He used to call his club the doctor. You see how he's put a, a leather facing in it there. That was after the days of feathery and into gutty. He was just trying to prevent the club being chipped because obviously he had a, a soft spot for it. That's Alan. 79. That was the first. The first score below 80 on the old course. 79. Some score that. Well, the course was much more difficult then. And two thirds wider now than in Alan's day. And the balls. <laughs> I mean, teeing up a feathery or an early gutty, you'd be, you'd be hoping to swipe it about 150 yards, 170 on a good day, so... Uh, yeah, you had to place your shots. Hmm. You know, I never broke 80 on the old course. But I was always there, or thereabout, up until my 74th year. So that shows you how sociable the course had become, eh? Hmm. And the first tee you'd play to the 17th green. The course was played in reverse then, you see. And no big double greens. Well, I mean, the greens were in the rough. And what I mean is that they were in a rough state. No equipment for cutting grass either. Uh, it was a great invention, that wee hand. <laughs> Even hell bunkers lying a bit dormant now, eh? So that 79's looking better already, eh? My son's beat it, though. No, oh, Tommy had a 77 in 1869, and J.O.F. equaled it in 1887. Joint records holders of the old course, eh? Took 26 years to beat Tommy's score. J.H. Taylor in the 1895 Open managed it. Oh, of course, was kinder to him then. A sweet bit of flat ground I'm walking along the Elysian Fields. It's the only bit of respite you got on the way out. <laughs> Bente Bunker. All the bunkers had names. Well, of course, they still do. The principal's nose, hell. Next bunker, coffin bunker, grave bunker. Yeah, cheerio. <laughs> yeah, well, the game was hard enough without getting stuck down one of these sandy craters, eh? <laughs> mm, plenty of room now. <laughs> Look at that. The beardies. They'd catch you on the way to the fifth green. Mm, you couldn't have let up. I'll give you an example of that. This club, uh, a rutting iron, was a weapon I'd have to use more than, more often than not to get round the loop. <laughs> a turn. Nowadays, folks are looking to pick up shots, where in my day, well, there's long grass, strong, thick heather, and the winds. Whew. Lose your bow, you'd lose your dog in them. <laughs> eh, eh, brambles, brambles and winds, eh? Yeah, my swing. Strong right leg. Split grip. Open stance. And let the whip of the club do the work for you. Yeah. Get yourself comfortable. Remember, you're going to stay down through the ball. Don't force it. A short spoon off the fairway. Same swing. Just make sure you stay down. And the grip, the hammer grip. Of course, big hands most of us early champions had. Willie Park, young Tommy. He used to break the shafts up near the grip with his strength. <laughs> of course, uh, no preferred lies. So your cleat got a fair bit of use. Multi-purpose. 
When the first set of rules came out in the 1740s, you weren't allowed to tee up the ball at all. With St Andrew's rules. All 13 of them. If you draw your club in order to strike and succeed as far into the stroke as to be bringing down your club, if then your club shall break in any way, it is to be accounted a stroke. <laughs> Makes you wonder how some of the gentlemen managed to get round the course before it got dark. Eh? <laughs> Changing with the tide. A bit like the green on the high hole. I always dreaded coming out here to see what was happening to that green. Some days you'd be struggling to find it. Soft and shifting, unpredictable, <laughs> like the weather. I had to build up a bank at the back of the green and head over to Holland for seed to plant in some long grass to hold back the sand. Oh, well, it worked. Stopped the drifting. That's when I had the, the idea to put a metal cup in the hole to hold it firm. The first metal cup. I suppose that made putting more difficult at times. But, uh, it used to be the size of a Balmoral bonnet, you see. <laughs> it's amazing how you can get round a problem when you have to, though. Nah. But when the wind got up here, <laughs> everybody playing had a problem. Because of the course being shaped like a shepherd's crook, there's not many holes that would help you. Always blown across you, right to left. Left to right. Mind you, nothing I like better than to be hitting downwind. Mm -hmm. The one time I'd, I'd take a good swipe at the ball. Yeah. In my younger day, in my day, mm -hmm. memories. The one thing I've left for the future, time to be thinking of my past. complaining. I've been lucky here. I've always kept myself fit. I had a swim every day of my working life, which was over 60 years. Three strokes out, four strokes back. No matter where I was, I'd find some water. <laughs> of course, I had this wonderful stretch of beach at my doorstep. This was just as well for I ducked myself hail, rain or shine. <laughs> That might seem a, a bit eccentric to you, but, oh, well, it, uh, it worked for me. <laughs> I had to have an active mind uh, and body to look after the old course and watch out for the caddies and, most important, the members and their matches. Aye, I must have walked that course hundreds of times. Eh? <laughs> anyway, back to this scrapbook. Uh, what have we got here? Ah, <laughs> James Ogilvy Fairley. He was captain here in 1850 and was instrumental in getting me the position of keeper of the greens at Prestwick. Ah, there he is again as a young man in his regimental armour. A proud man, justifiably so. We're here. Ah, his family at Coodham. Stayed just outside Prestwick. Ooh, big house. Mm, there's all these sons. There's all these sons here. <laughs> no golfers. Six sons. Phew. <laughs> Future captains of the Royal and Ancient Golf Club. <laughs> I took Nancy, my wife, and young Tommy, just newly born, from the east coast to the west coast, you could say. <laughs> After that, J.O.F. was born, and John, and Lizzie. Ah, the Earl of Eglinton. His idea, the course at Prestwick. I mean, well, he was the, the figurehead, really. Mm. <laughs> when he stayed up at Eglinton Castle, they just stopped near Urban. Of course, that was the time they put the railway in, you know, the Glasgow Air Railway. So, because it was running through his land, he would just stop the train any time he liked. It was his right, you see. So, I suppose that was the, the starting point for thinking of building the links there. <laughs> Aye, because here we have the minutes of Prestwick Golf Club. Bell. Ah, 
I still go back to Prestwick. Harold Hilton won the, the last Open Championship I saw there. Well, the course is in fine condition now. Well worth all the work since that first meeting in the Red Lion. Yeah, we didn't have much room to build a championship course. Well, not that we knew it would be at the time. Twelve holes, a bit cramped as you can see. And balls were crossing you from all angles. Well, you had to watch out for yourself. <laughs> I designed a few greens in my time. Muirfield, Dornich, oh, a lot of courses. From the Shetland Isles to Cornwall, walked every venue. One pound a day plus travelling expenses. Hmm. Right. This is a friendly bit of grass compared with most places when you strayed off the line. <laughs> yeah, if you weren't much of a player, it could take you a, a while to find a fairway again on some of the early courses. <laughs> yeah. I often just uh, drop a ball in a bunker and play it. Doesn't it matter to me now where it goes? As long as it's out. <laughs> I'm fond of sand. I built my greenkeeping career on it. Sand, mere sand. That was my cry. I'd been bringing a barrel load of it over to freshen up the Cardinal's knob and spilt some over by the 10th green. I always had bother with that green. So I'd started a temporary one. The funny thing, but I I noticed about six weeks later that the grass around where the sand had dropped seemed to have revived itself a bit. So from that day on, I threw it down in as many weak patches as I saw fit, so to speak. The old swing's still there. I was saying, you, you, you could say I, I built my green-keeping reputation on that that wee accident. Hmm. Oh, it was a, a fine setup I had here, with a workshop, a house opposite the Red Lion, and the encouragement I got from the members. Not that there was a lot of money spent. <laughs> Three pounds a month was my salary. Oh, it was enough. Nancy saw to that. Hmm. Prestwick Tom. And they called me in the 50s, even though I was a born and bred St. Andrian. Well, I represented the club in many a match. Mostly against Willie Parr from Musselboro, and battles we had. Of course, I was in my prime. Unfortunately, so was he. Couldn't tell you the amount of times I, I teed off against Willie Park. Oh, some games, some games. 36 holes, 36 rounds, 12 at Musselburgh, 12 at North Berwick, 12 at St Andrews. Eh? Just think about that. Athletes in these days, you had to be. Hmm. She used to frighten me. The power he used to swipe the ball with that play club. Hmm. He always going for his shots was Willie, and more often than not, it came off for him. Of course, deadly putter as well. Hmm. Ah, what crowds used to come and watch our matches? One hundred pounds stake. Sounds grand, doesn't it? Of course, we wouldn't be paid that. We'd just get a fee for it and be up to the, the gentlemen sponsors of the game that sort that out. I suppose it was a way of attracting the crowds. But, uh, ah, a draft letter from James Ogilby Fairley. <laughs> a key letter, this. A key letter. It's written to Black Heath from Prestwick Golf Club, 1860. It was proposed by Prestwick Golf Club to give a challenge belt to be played for by professional golfers. 36 holes with three rounds on the Prestwick links. All right. Player who succeeds in holding his ball, oh, well, we all know the rules. <laughs> uh, the game's to be played on the links at 12 noon on Wednesday, 17th of October, 
It is desirable that the player shall be a known and respectable caddy. <laughs> eh. There. Look at that. The challenge belt. Earl of Eglinton donated that. Magnificent, isn't it? Of course, it was red Morocco leather. And wonderful silver work on it. Something to play for. Yeah, we're back to the minutes at Prestwick again here, see? <laughs> Thomas Morris Prestwick and Robert Andrew, Perth. William Park, Musselburgh. Alexander Smith, Brunsfield. William Steele, Brunsfield. Charlie Hunter, Prestwick, St. Nicholas. George Daniel Brown, Black Heath. Andrew Strath, St. Andrews. Miss Willie Park, one, one, seven, four strokes. Tom Morris, 176, uh, beaten by two shots. <laughs> Willie Steele took 232, that's 16 over sixes. It's hardly surprising there's no photograph of him in this book, is it? <laughs> Won it the next year, didn't I? And the year after that, 61, 62. <laughs> 13 shots, I won in 62. Hmm? Never been a better winning margin than that. Of course, there was only four professionals playing in it, but uh, minor detail. Uh, from my point of view. <laughs> ah, there's, there's Charlie Hunter and I there. Playing in the 61 Open, I think that was. <laughs> oh, here, look. My winning card in the 64 Open. 54, 56, 55. <laughs> I won five pounds. That's the first time the winner was actually paid. Oh, I up to then you got the championship belt. In fact, uh, when I was runner-up, I got three pounds, so it's... Uh, it wasn't so bad, but oh, there was obviously no very much money in these early days. <laughs> ah. A letter of resignation to Prestwick. Hmm. Royal and Ancient invited me back to St Andrews, so I was pleased to come home, but uh, I did miss the, the setting sun of Aaron and the walks along the beaches with the dogs of an evening. Keeper of the Greens or custodian of the links. I'm presented with my emblems of office, a barrow, a bucket and a spade. And of course a salary of 50 pounds per annum. <laughs> and now here's a thing. Look at this. Young Tommy at his first tournament in Perth. Same year, 13 he was. <laughs> we arrived by train. Willie well, Park was there, he says. Well, have you brought the boy for, Tom? And I says, just you wait and see. <laughs> of course, he didn't actually play in that tournament. We matched him against another boy there, but oh, there was more of a crowd watching their match than the tournament itself. <laughs> so he'd made his mark. And I'd watched him down at Prestwick there over that 13 years, and a wee boy rabbiting about the coast, and the first club going in his hand, this big athletic swing developing. <laughs> Ah, Leith. Ah, here he is. Now you can see my brother George, Tommy, myself, Willie Dunn, Jamie Anderson, Andrew Strath. There's Willie Park. Oh, he's in the next one here. Ah, this is all the competitors in this one. I must have won that day because it looks as if I'm getting to pretend to hit the ball. Now, of course things are starting to build up now. As you can see here, Prestwick's got a clubhouse. 1868. Here Tommy wins. Of course, all the Opens were played in the early days at Prestwick. My, my. Tommy with the belt. I was a proud man that day. Even more than when I'd won it myself. 
Oh, and here's the the winning card, 1870. Tommy defending the championship. Opens up with a 47. A record score never to be beaten on that 12 hole course. <laughs> That's style, eh? The belt was his in about 12 shots. Yeah. He swing. <laughs> he put everything into that. His bonnet used to be falling off his head, all the long shots, you know, but oh, he's putting. That was heaven sent, heaven sent. Because there was no, no championship in 1871. Not just because Tommy had won the belt outright, but sadly our main man, James Ogilvy, fairly died. And of course, he was the main administrator. And the Earl of Eglinton dies just at the end of 70 as well, the man who presented the belt. So it took them a while to get organised. And they did get it started again with this new cup. Tommy won it again. Poor enough. Oh, no. we had a new a new cup and also had a new venue. So the Open arrived in St Andrews in 1873. Of course, everybody thought Tommy would win that, but it uh, well, can be a bit of a lottery at times, you know. I mean, you're just playing in the one day and uh, the ground was heavy and there was puddles everywhere. Local man, Tom Kidd, won it. <laughs> Surprised everybody that. And of course, Musselburgh came on the scene as well. And they took on the Open. Of course, that was a nine-hole course, so you played you played four times round there, still playing 36 holes, remember. <laughs> This time Tommy was ooh, playing exhibition matches all over the country, from here to Westward Ho. Mm. Tommy was becoming a bit of a celebrity by this time. He, with his amiable nature, everybody took to him. Fifeshire Journal, November 1874, Young Tom's Marriage. Hmm. Entertainment. On Wednesday evening, Mr. Thomas Morris entertained at supper his workmen and a few friends in the Golf Hotel on the occasion of the marriage of his son, Tom Morris Jr., to Margaret Brennan, school teacher. And my, what a bonny couple they were. After a substantial repast and the usual toast being drunk, Mr. Mitchell proposed the health of Tom Morris Jr., who they must no longer call Tommy, remarking on his distinguished career as a golfer and many victories and trophies he had won. His performances were not in the least abated, as shown by having twice this autumn defeated Willie Park. <laughs> Willie wasn't he pleased about that. <laughs> the most formidable opponent that could be brought against him. <laughs> The health of the bride, Mr. and Mrs. Morris Sr., and the usual shop toast, Lang may the hammer strike and the lathe turn, brought the proceedings to a very agreeable close. I'll have to tell you, that uh, page I passed by just now, September the 6th, 1875, Tom and I were playing a golf match at North Berwick. No, he wasn't keen to go. Of course, Margaret was heavyweight's child, but no, no, she encouraged him, and of course I was keen. What folk, folk gonna be there? 25 pound side bet. So we went. It was a good match. Played well, out in two 46s, and hit a bit of sand, but no, no, we were well in the lead. But oh, the Park brothers, they came back at us again. And we just managed to win on the last green. As we came off the green, there was a, a telegram waiting for us, saying that Margaret was struggling with a child. Mr. Lewis, the local member there, he went to see schooner and full crew, and they took us right across the Firth of Forth. Unbeknown to us, another telegram had arrived, saying that both Margaret and his child had died. So, a long journey across that firth. That frozen look Tommy had on his face haunts me still. Like the early photographs I carry of him. 
My brother George met us in the wee boat in the bay. He told me, of course, I got into the boat with Tommy and I had to tell him straight away. He shouted out, it's no true, but... Aye, but it was. It was a sad, pathetic homecoming. Oh, his grief was insurmountable. Oh, we tried, we, we all tried. We, he started drinking. He just didn't seem to care about anything. We set up a golf match against Bob Martin and Davy Strath, old adversaries. Oh, the whole town came out to support it. <laughs> Four up and five to go, playing well. And he just broke down. And of course, we lost the last five holes in the match. His drinking just got steadily worse in his moods. His heart just wasn't in anything. It was, it was up in the cathedral grounds with his wife and Bairn. We had one last try. Captain Molesworth came up from Westwood Hall and threw out a challenge in the Scottish field. One of his sons would play any professional for a third. That means he gets a shot every third hole and... Ah, Tommy said he would do it. Beginning of November it was. Oof, bitter weather. Six matches they played. Oh, Tommy, Tommy was winning easily, but Molehurst uh, oh, insisted on playing on. Because he was so run down, Tommy was chilled to the marrow. He went downhill very quickly, but... He seemed to rally. He... He went over to Edinburgh, just a week before Christmas, to see some of his friends. Came back Christmas Eve, went up to see his mother. Nancy was an invalid by this time. I heard him get up on Christmas morning. <laughs> I heard him. After an hour, he wasn't coming down, and I went up to see him. There he was, lying as peaceful as I'd seen him since... He was dead. Because of the suddenness of it, they did an autopsy at the cottage hospital, saying he had burst a, an artery in his lung. <laughs> People say he died of a broken heart. And if that was true, I wouldn't be here either. There was a memorial erected by 60 clubs in the cathedral ground there. An analogy written to him. I can find it in this book. Beneath the sod, poor Tommy's laid, bunkered now for good and all. A better, a better golfer never, never played. played. A, a further, further or a sure ball. ball. Among the monarchs Among the, the monarchs or the green, <laughs> for long he held imperial sway, and none the start and end between could match with Tommy in his day. A triple laurel round his brow, the light of triumph in his ear. He stands before us even now, as in the hour of victory. Thrice belted knight of peerless skill, again we see him head the fray, and memory loves to reckon still the feats of Tommy in his day. St. Andrews, 
wondering what things are coming to. Hmm. Well, of course, how they started. Hmm. This golf of Dutch origin. Golf? <laughs> no, I don't know. There are certainly references to the, the King Jameses of the 15th century forbidding golf on a Sunday, on a Sabbath, quite right, too. Some of these young kings were schooled here in the castle. But you never knew that, eh? No, oh, eh? Never heard of them playing here, though. But of course, you're surrounded by, by the history of the town. I think a bit more about it now. St. Salvatore's. The oldest part of the university. <laughs> a handy landmark that when you were playing in on the course at times with a new member. Just, uh, just aim on the steeple, sir. <laughs> 1412, this was founded. Just uh, a few years before James II, I think it was, said uh, golf was interfering with archery or was it footy ball? some of the students look now. Well, maybe it's just, just me getting older and the grand old man of golf. Hmm. I suppose. Hmm. Rules. Courses. Hmm. Traditions. Yeah, the captain's balls. Hmm. You know, every, every new captain of the Royal and Ancient Golf Club put a silver ball on a silver club. Done it since 1754. The gold one if you were royalty. Oh, it was a great tradition, that. I still do it. <laughs> I remember as a boy how the local folk would pipe the members from the cobbled end of the town down to the course to start the spring meeting. Oh, great celebrations. Colourful affair it was. <laughs> I was free as a bird then. Eight, nine years old. With my musket, fife and drum. <laughs> Aye, all the members in their red jackets, and the wives in their fancy crinolines and bonnets. High society. <laughs> Seems a long time ago. It was a long time ago. <laughs> a lot of women are playing the game now. <laughs> Lady Margaret Scott. <laughs> Some swing. Very graceful. Mary Queen of Scots stayed here. You know, she was seen playing golf on the links of Bransfield one week after the murder of her husband Darnley. <laughs> Guy suspicious that, eh? <laughs> Aye, but the ladies, <laughs> they put a bit of colour and charm back into the game. Hmm? Oh, I'm all for that. <laughs> right. Traditions are dying. Some call that progress. Yeah. There's courses springing up here, there, everywhere. <laughs> Hundreds playing now. Yeah. You can even, even buy a weekly publication about the game. Well, there's still characters about, and Donald Blue. <laughs> when I'm a caddy's here, he's still trying to sell postcards of himself to anybody that'll listen to him. <laughs> oh, there's my caddy list, 1877. Three Open Champions registered on that, eh? <laughs> I wonder what these three champions, the triumvirate, we'd have thought of that, eh? Just 30 years ago, too. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, for my retirement. 1904, all the members were very good to me, but... Uh, oh, I was still involved in everything, as you can see, uh, here. <laughs> here I'm uh, watching Mr. Balfour playing himself in his captain that year, and oh, fine shot he hit. 
There's Harry Varden lining up in the first tee in the match against Sandy Heard. Yeah, I've had to sit down in this one. It's uh, the Lumbago playing up. Mm -hmm. yeah, Braid playing off. Scotland England match. Good for some that, eh? Barn and Taylor against Braid and Heard. Mm -hmm. Here I am tending the flag for Willie Park Jr. <laughs> there I am at the last open in St Andrews. James Braid playing off the railway line at the 16th. Ooh, he was a worried man, but I hey, won it. You won it. <laughs> that. Uh, Photograph I pointed out to you when I introduced myself, you know, the, the shop there. Bob Martin's still working away, second on the left there, twice winner of the open there, eh? and J.O.F. in the doorway. He died just two years ago, John before him, and my daughter Lizzie. It's not fair to have favourites, but... Ah. <laughs> so I'm on moan. I've got my faith. You know, church elder for years. It's funny how things go in full circle, though. Look at this. <laughs> I started as a ball maker, and look, they're advertising them now. <laughs> oh, this one tickles me. The professional's ball. Mm, I look quite sprightly running into this picture, eh? Last year, a foreigner won the championship. A Frenchman, Arnold Massey. Would you imagine that from these early days? I see, they've even erected an exhibition tent at the open. Oh, I doubt if that'll be a popular thing. Hmm. I'll better tell you how I died. Well, you did realise I've been dead for over 80 years. <laughs> I was made an honorary member of the new golf club. I used to go down there of an afternoon and have a black strap and uh, oh, maybe two or three whiskies. One day I was going to the toilet I mistook the stair for the wine cellar and fractured my skull and died in the cottage hospital the next morning. After all that, I lived through it. So I didn't die of natural causes. <laughs> my memorial hymn sheet. That bonny voice you've been hearing throughout. The ghost of, ghost of Tommy's wife, Margaret. That haunting song, God of Bethel, you can see it there. It was the memorial hymn at my service. And the funeral, you can see from this photograph, a, a fitting end to the scrapbook. My coffin passing Alan Robertson's tombstone. Hmm. Now, one last visit to the Royal and Ancient Golf Club. Follow me. champion, Freddie Tate, killed in the Boer War, height of his career too. Hmm. Uh, John White Melville, the past captain, in the red jacket on him. My beloved Swilkin Bridge, the home hall. Kirkcaldy behind me there. He took over my position as Keeper of the Greens. Doesn't he look overly fond to see me again, does he? Thank you. 
The captain's balls. The George Glennie medal. Remember I told you about him? The Kolkata Cup. Wonderful trophies. The Jubilee vase. The club's gold medals, 1806. Ah, eh? uh, uh, the belt. Mm, Favourite portrait, this of mine. The Right Honourable E.J. Balfour. There he is, teeing off. And uh, my usual duty, teeing up the ball for the captain. That man there in the fawn suit, that's J.O. Fairley. One of the sons I told you about, one of the six sons of Captain. Hmm. The caddies hanging about there, Skipper and Kerstorfin. Hmm. Ah, but this picture brings back memories, eh? An old starter's box, the members. Hmm. Now every one of these gentlemen by name, you know. Every one of them. Time's work. Mm, Martyr's Monument. Mm. My portrait by Sir George Reed. I remember it's before he started painting it, he said, Now, Tom, this is maybe going to take a while, so I want you to adopt. A position appertaining to golf that you'll feel comfortable with. So I just did this. And he says, well, what does that signify? And I said, I'm just waiting for the gentleman to play. <laughs> to me, that was as important as the play in itself. Folk are far more interested in just their own games nowadays. And instead of appreciating the comradeship, the courses and what's all around them. Might look as if my early days were a wee bit subservient, but no, no, no. There was a mutual respect, a common ground, a sharing of this great game, which has been my life. Challenge belt. Maybe just one more time.
my peace. 